thing we can say about wilderness is that it is a perceived reality. It has to do more with our state of mind, with our perception, than it does with an environmental condition. A mountain's a mountain, a river's a river. Wilderness, one person could say it is, another person could say it isn't. So there's a lot of subjectivity in wilderness. But there's something I think we can agree on, and that is that it refers to a condition, an environmental condition, or it could be a form of life, or it could even be a river that is not controlled. Controlled by humans, controlled by technological civilization. A dam on a river is control. Pavement is control. So for a compact definition of wilderness, you could say self-willed land. Land that is not controlled. Land that is responding to its own needs, its own evolutionary trajectory, self-willed land. Same token, a wild animal is one that is not domesticated. Cow, obviously, is controlled. Deer, not controlled. Um, we can use the term wild uh, to refer to that condition of having its own self-will. Willed, contracted to wild, is what we're talking about. A wilderness happens to be land that is self-willed, but there can be myriad components of that and myriad situations that are wildernesses. I can see, and I think some people in the book have pointed out, that there can be wildernesses in urban situations. The presence of human civilization frequently has altered, changed conditions on the planet. So to have an area that is wild gives emphasis to the idea of sharing the planet with other life forms, allowing them to have their place in the sun, allowing them to pursue their evolutionary future. For the most part, when we use the term in terms of public lands and in terms of recreation and in terms of evolution, we're talking about a pretty big piece of country that is answering to nothing but its own will and is self-willed. In 1963, one of my heroes, a man who wrote the Wilderness Act of 1964, his name was Howard Zonheiser, published a little essay in which he said, you can either be a gardener or a guardian when it comes to wild places. If you're a gardener, you go in there and you intervene, you control, you change things. If you're a guardian, on the other hand, you simply protect its opportunity to respond to its own rhythms, to its own evolutionary directives. And I have always thought of myself as a partisan of being a guardian. I think it's really important on this planet that there are places that support species that are not gardened, that are not controlled, that are not directed, say, by human aesthetics or by human recreational needs, but instead by their own evolutionary directives. And for me, wilderness is a place that um, needs guardians, not so much gardeners. One of the modifications that I would be in favor of has to do with corridors of access for wild creatures. I very much applaud the fact that wolves, bears, other creatures are moving south into land that used to be their range. They're doing this without active human intervention. They're doing this on their own, self-willed, you could say. And when they come to a freeway, that's obviously a major barrier to them. So I applaud the people who are working on ways to allow wildlife to cross such barriers. It could be overpasses, it could be underpasses. I don't believe putting them in a cage and carrying them into a new range is nearly as appropriate as encouraging them by such things as these overpasses and underpasses, these corridors of connectivity. That to me seems the appropriate way to garden. Island civilization is a term that I give to a vision uh, long in the future that sees the consolidation and compactness 
of civilization and leaving most of the world wild. Uh, I'm looking down the road in this vision perhaps a thousand years. And I talk about various future alternatives that, that might be there. And I think that we need those alternatives, those visions of the future, if we're going to make good decisions. And one of the things that drives me toward the idea of island civilization is that we are but one species of 30, maybe 100 million on this planet, most of whom are wild, most of whom are not controlled by us, most of whom are not driven by our tastes and our needs and our values. It seems to me that respecting that fact and the evolutionary process requires us to work toward lessening our impact on this planet. And one way to do that would be to reduce population and to reduce our sprawl into areas that have not been controlled. Island civilization, where civilization exists as islands in a matrix of wilderness, would be one answer. One thing I fear is that the idea of a partnership of human beings with another life form almost inevitably, it seems to me, results in the human element dominating, doing it for some ulterior motive, um, such as developing domestic species. Uh, it's all about us. It's been all about us, meaning humans, for 10,000 years. Since the change from a hunting-gathering people to a herding and agriculture people, we've had huge impacts on nature. We have domesticated, meaning controlled, meaning eliminated wildness, for many creatures on the planet. My trust of humans is, is low. As an educator, I would like to think that we can do better. I would like to think that we could be impelled by love or we could be impelled by fear to work out a new way to occupy this planet. I call it, as the book suggests, island civilization. I just think we have decisions to make right now. One switchback at a time. First switchback is to preserve biodiversity. If our gardening efforts can result in the preservation of biodiversity rather than the elimination of it, if we have the maturity and the humility to say we value creatures that are no use to us, that are even threats to us, if we have that kind of humility, then I think that gardening could lead the way toward a, a fuller approach to island civilization. Wilderness is usually thought of as an area, as a place, usually an extensive place, a place, to use the same root word, where you can be bewildered. It's not a word we use very much, but the word bewilder stems from that same root as wilderness, self-willed, people not in control, people becoming bewildered. First and more of a place. Uh, wildness is a quality that can be exhibited by something as humble as a, as a small plant, as an insect that is growing without encouragement by humans, uh, that is self willed, that is pursuing its own evolutionary future. Human civilization has been struggling against wilderness for 10,000 years. Wilderness did not really exist before the advent of herding and agriculture and what we call settlements and civilization. Hunters and gatherers don't understand the word wilderness. But with corrals and town walls and gates and moats, we began to define what we controlled from what we did not control, the civilized and the wild. And that sliding scale, perceived reality, subjectivity, that sliding scale is one of the very exciting things I think about this book, because you're getting varying perceptions of wildness and its importance.